Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be going through the topic of air and water. And so these are the relevant topics that we'll be going through. So have a quick read and uh, we'll, we'll begin the video. So air is composed of nitrogen being 78% and oxygen being 21%. The other percentage is comprised of argon and other noble gases along with carbon dioxide. So nitrogen and oxygen can be separated from the air by liquefying the air and then separating the two gases by fractional distillation. So air is basically first filtered to remove dust and things like that and then cooled to around negative 200 degrees which is when air, the, the gas form, turns into liquid air. So once you have liquid air you can use fractional distillation to remove or separate the two, uh, the two elements. So liquid air is passed into the bottom of the fractionated column and of course fractional distillation utilizes the idea that the bottom part of the fractionated column has a different heat or is warmer than the top part. And we can see that because the entering temperature is around 200 degrees negative and you've got negative 185 at the bottom and negative 190 at the top so the bottom is warmer. So what happens is because nitrogen liquefies at negative 185 negative 196 degrees, the bottom part here which is negative 185 is way too hot. What that means is that the liquid nitrogen that comes in with liquid air will actually boil down at the bottom and it will rise to the top where gaseous nitrogen is uh, taken out and stored. The bottom part, oxygen, the liquid oxygen can be sort of uh, piped out down at the bottom and uh, that's you know pretty simple and we can store that. So we've essentially separated nitrogen and oxygen as simple as that. The pollutants of air mainly are carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen and lead compounds and you need to know the sources of these uh, pollutants along with how, that, how it can affect our body and the environment basically. So carbon monoxide is caused or produced from the incomplete combustion of carbon based fuels. So normally uh, if you burn carbon in sufficient oxygen you'll actually form carbon dioxide. In incomplete combustion, for example when you don't have enough oxygen you'll actually form carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. So carbon monoxide is detrimental to our health because it binds permanently to red blood cells and uh, the red blood cells normally carry oxygen so basically the carbon monoxide prevents the transport of oxygen and uh, that can lead to serious problems. So here is the chemical reaction that is relevant to that. Sulfur dioxide is formed by burning fossil fuels which contain sulfur and uh, the sulfur can actually cause acid rain and uh, that can cause deforestation and building damage and things like that and so of course sulfur added to oxygen will give you sulfur dioxide in this equation here. The oxides of nitrogen is made when nitrogen and oxygen react at really high temperatures and you find that inside car engines. Bear in mind that it's not actually the combustion inside the engines that are causing uh, the, these uh, pollutants to form. The oxides of nitrogen again is just caused because there's high temperatures inside car engines and that causes the nitrogen and the oxygen inside the air uh, to, to react with each other. And Oxides of nitrogen can cause severe respiratory problems along with the fact that it can also cause acid rain as well. So here are two equations that you should know for that. Lead compounds are present in lead petrol and so ingestion of these things can actually damage the brain and have uh, pretty you know, bad consequences in terms of what it does to our nervous system in general. So one way to counteract the production of uh, uh, well, oxides of nitrogen inside car engines is to install a catalytic converter. So this is a pretty smart way of sort of neutralizing these pollutants. So basically what it does is it catalyzes the reaction between nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide, producing carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And as you know, carbon dioxide isn't that bad. Um, it can also catalyze the reaction between nitrogen dioxide along with carbon monoxide and uh, it forms again carbon dioxide and nitrogen and this is really smart because it removes two pollutants which is nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide at the same time to produce two uh, fairly uh, non-harmful elements or uh, sorry not elements just um, products. So let's talk about rust right so rust is hydrated iron oxide that's all that it is so Hydrated means that there's water and iron oxide is just simply the product 
of or the ionic product of iron combining with oxygen. So therefore, rusting can only happen in iron or steel because steel contains iron, and um, and therefore only iron or steel can be termed rusting. Everything else is technically corroding, right? So not only do you need iron or steel for rusting to happen, you need water and oxygen because obviously it's it's the reaction between iron and oxygen, um, and inclusive of water. So all three things have to be present. So a couple of methods of rust prevention would mainly be to sort of uh, offer some sort of physical boundary so that the iron doesn't react with oxygen. So it can be, for example, painting um, using oil or grease, uh, which acts as a coating but also effective as a lubricant in moving parts of machinery and things like that. Uh, perhaps coating with plastic, uh, you know, planting, and galvanizing. Uh, so galvanizing is important because it offers sort of something called sacrificial protection. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail. Yeah, so the first thing about sacrificial protection is the idea that there's a difference in reactivity between zinc and iron. Remember, in this reactivity series, zinc is higher up than iron, suggesting that zinc is more reactive, which means that zinc would much prefer to be in its ionic form rather than iron. So it has a higher tendency of zinc to go into its ionic form rather than um, iron. So what happens is that here, um, this is the standard coating uh, to the right, right? So this is not sacrificial protection, and this is just the standard idea that uh, you can coat the iron with tin. But the problem is, when the tin wears off and there's exposure of the iron, the oxygen can easily come and oxidize the iron, and so the iron goes from iron element into the ionic form, which is I, uh, iron cations, basically, Fe2+. And as that happens, you start to lose the iron and basically cause rust. Now, in sacrificial coating, you coat it with zinc rather than tin, and of course, the zinc is more reactive than iron. So even if you do get a little bit of hole forming and the breakdown of the zinc coating, what will happen is that the oxygen doesn't oxidize the iron, but it actually reacts with the zinc instead. Remember, because zinc is more reactive than iron. So rather than the iron corroding or rusting, the zinc will take its place. Therefore, it sort of sacrifices itself uh, for the iron, and therefore you don't get as much um, rusting going on. So here are some chemical tests for water, right? So water will basically turn anhydrous copper sulfate from white to blue. So here is the reaction. You got copper sulfate, um, which obviously does not contain any water, which is the anhydrous form. You add that to water and you get the hydrous uh, or hydrated copper sulfate. Um, so anhydrous copper sulfate has a white color, but the hydrated copper sulfate will have the blue color. So if you were to add something to anhydrous copper sulfate and it changes color from white to blue, then you know that you know water must be present. Um, similarly, water will turn anhydrous cobalt chloride from blue to pink. Um, and you can use like a cobalt chloride paper for this, but ultimately the cobalt chloride anhydrous form will be blue. And if you sort of add any sort of water to it, it will turn pink, as you see there. So a couple of sort of uh, you know points about water. The treatment of water includes filtration through sand and gravel uh, to remove undissolved solids from it. You can treat that with chlorine to kill off bacteria, and then you can supply that to consumers. Therefore, because it's, it's safe to drink. Uh, there's a couple of uses of water, and many of these are sort of self-explanatory and common sense. But you know you can use it for drinking, uh, growing food producing good, recreation even, maintaining ecosystems, there's a whole lot that you can list here. Some implications of poor water supply would be the health issues from lack of sanitized water, which can obviously cause a lot of different problems, um, and reduced crop yields, because obviously water is, is important uh, to grow plants. 
So thank you for watching guys, that's it for today's videos. Please like, share and subscribe and if you haven't heard already, I have started a Patreon channel so please think about joining and supporting me there. You will gain access to a lot of past paper tutorials. I've completed 15 years worth of tutorials for biology and I will be, coming, uh, I will be moving on to chemistry very very soon. Uh, so look out for that but otherwise I will see you in the next video. Cheers!